Oi oi people, Silky here and you're listening to the Life Art Musician podcast. A podcast exploring the minds of creatives who've dedicated their lives to pursuing a career in music. The Life of Musician podcast is brought to you by Hookings Management, my artist services company that empowers our fellow DIY musicians to grow a monetized fan base without a record label. We offer a range of services such as online marketing, artist mentorship, release campaign management, videography, photography, graphic and website design, plus tons more useful services that are built to cater for independent musicians on small, self-funded budgets. Helping musicians market and monetize their art form is our passion. So if you're an artist that needs help taking your career to the next level, please feel free to reach out and get in touch via hookingsmanagement.com where you can book a video call with me for some free advice on your project. On today's episode, I'm joined by my dear friend and lead singer in DIY indie rock and roll band Bracknell, Jack Dacey. They're currently midway through their debut headline tour of the UK and Ireland and have sold out every day in advance. They've done this with no record label backing, no booking agent, it's a completely self-promoted tour. Myself and the team at Hookings Management have been helping the Bracknell market and monetize their music independently for the past few years and it's been an absolute joy helping them grow their DIY music business. I'm sure our listener base of like-minded DIY musicians are going to find this conversation very valuable. So without further ado, let's get into it. Jack Dacey, how are you my friend? Very good mate, very good. How are you? Very well, mate. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast. Pleasure to be here. Big weekend, mate, wasn't it? So It weren't boys, bad, was it? You boys out Birmingham, didn't you, on the Friday? <laughs> yeah. First headline uh, show of your UK tour. That was sold out, wasn't it? Yes, mate. Yeah, sold out. We've moved up to the bigger room with like, I don't know, seven or eight days to go. And we sold that fucker out and all. Amazing, mate. And then it was the big gig, at Electric Ballroom, Saturday night. Yes, um, mate, with you, you boys. Were, yeah, main support. Um, yeah, mate. Fucking just uh, unreal, wasn't it? Unreal, man. Just <laughs> it was mad. It was fucking like. I mean, Birmingham was wicked, obviously. Yeah, let, let's talk about Birmingham first. So, so for you guys, that's your first out of town gig, isn't it? Self promoted, yeah. like yeah. out of town headline show. Yeah. So you've done the Camden Underworld, um, sold that out uh, just before Christmas, wasn't it? 500 tickets. Yeah, yeah. Prior to that, what was it, about a year before, Dublin Castle? Yeah, just just over a year, yeah. And that was a couple of hundred as well, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. But Birmingham was the first time you've, you've, you've played outside of London and Essex, your own headline show. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, how did that feel, mate? Like, sold out room. You sold it out, like, months in advance, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that was the mad thing. Like the, Even from Dublin Castle to the Underworld. So Dublin Castle, don't get me wrong, it was a sellout. They'd fucking take them all, wouldn't you? But that sold out, like, I don't know, a week of, which was like a buzz. And then the Underworld sold out, like, three and a half months before. So, you, you know... You start thinking, yeah, we're fucking, this is going somewhere. But Birmingham playing the first one out of town is pretty mad. Like, that was, uh, that's like just a much smaller scale of what you fucking think about when you first start, like, going all over the country and fucking playing these shows and everyone. And hearing people sing it back in different accents is just fucking mad to me. Like, mm. well, it's, it's testament to all the hard work you boys have put in um you know not not just the past few years where you've been investing in uh, uh marketing more um but prior to that it was years and years of grinding in rehearsal rooms and doing toilet shows on on the circuit around Essex and London um so it's great to see it finally paying off and um yeah i was buzzing watching the videos uh friday night um on social media i was glued to it like just <laughs> watching watching your instagram feed and it was great to see like a yeah a, a venue full of packed brummies singing every word to every tune yeah man it's and it's like they it feels like loyal fan base as well like you say mm. it feels like more than people just taking a punt and like oh i'll come down and have a go like people were there to watch it they knew they knew every fucking song. It was it was class, like wicked, mate. You, you don't, yeah. You can't. I don't think. Well, obviously, it's going to scale up and get bigger and bigger. But you can't. That. You. I don't think that will ever get boring. I just don't see mm. how that can ever like. If even if it's that, 
it won't be. But even if it's that size forever, mm. fucking hell. Yeah, it's an incredible thing, mate. And, and Saturday at the Electric Ballroom, um, say a bit different for you because obviously, you know, we're a ska band. We've got certainly like got um, indie elements to what we do, but you, you boys and Laurie Wright's band, very much indie rock and roll. Um, so was you like a little bit apprehensive, like um, you know, pay, yeah. playing to fifteen hundred uh, like skinheads and mods? Essentially, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some mad air cuts in that room when you <laughs> play a show. It's it's mad. But no, it was. I think as a support thing, like that's kind of like the bit of the buzz of the support thing as well. When it's yeah. like, right, we've got a room full of people to win over here, as opposed to like where like you go out on stage cocksure yourself you mean you do you go out cocksure yourself every time or you wouldn't bother would you <laughs> but like, I was going to say mate in no shades <laughs> in that jacket you wore Saturday night <laughs> I contemplated the shades tonight but I thought it was a step too far <laughs> but no nah, like Birmingham was, was obviously like you knew they were there for us it was a thing so it, I mean listen when you play a good room it's fucking great whenever isn't it but yeah. the thing that does help as well playing to a, like a scar crowd or like a subculture sort of thing mm. Like they're in, do you know what I mean? It's like a, it's like proper chin rubbing music fans. Like they want to hear it, they want to listen. So yeah. I felt that from the start. Like I thought I felt like they was with us. Like yeah, which was great. Well, I knew when booking news it would go down really well because I think people get it a bit twisted and think that people that love ska music just love ska music. But um, you know our audience like love guitar music. Do you know what I mean? Um, and and yeah, you boys fucking had that room, didn't you? Yeah, and it was amazing. Laurie was Wright as well, like early yeah, doors. Obviously, it was an early show, so this is something the listeners might find interesting. If you don't already know, when you're hiring venues like the Electric Ballroom, the Underworld, um, you know the bread and butter um, for these venues now is these club nights every Friday and Saturday night. They have to split the night into two and do live music, and then. They have their deals with the club promoters uh, week in, week out, and that helps the venue survive, you know, having that um, extra predictable income. Yeah. What that means for us, uh, like, bands that are promoting ourselves is it's an early curfew. Yeah. We've got to be out by 10 p.m. So it was an early door time when it was 6 p.m. doors. Laurie was on at 10 past 6. Even that, it was mobbed for Laurie. And it was busy. 10 past early 6. Doors. Like that, yeah, that's... yeah. Um, and then, yeah, by the time you boys come on at 7.45, it was pretty much a full room, wasn't it? Yeah, it's got, it's got, that's got to be the biggest crowd we've played to, I thought. Like, it was, like, some of the photos, when you look back on it, like, because obviously when you can only see the first three rows, really, can't you? Mm. But it's like the, some of the photos where, like, you, the flash goes all the way back it's like fucking hell that was a full room like mm. yeah and just you just want to go and do that again desperately. yeah and we were saying earlier weren't we before we um, started recording like what a fucking great room the electric ballroom is man it's 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 the like it's the only one of that size in Camden and Camden is like I reckon most people would consider Camden like the hub of like guitar music mm. like especially grassroots yeah like alternative punk yeah culture. yeah like yeah it's camden town isn't yeah it, like? man and and it, and like the, the sound on stage is great like nothing when you listen to a sound check and you feel like a bass drum proper go through you're like oh i guess my cock are that i love it <laughs> <laughs> and it's fun and, and yeah and and, and that is as well. I've I've seen bands play there, like mm. serious bands that you consider like fucking hell. They're doing it, and so to to do that, in it's like hallowed ground almost sort of thing. It like, is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like you, you mentioned earlier, <coughs> the Verve played their London show there on the Northern Soul yeah, Tour, didn't man. they? Madness uh, and the Specials played some of their iconic shows there. Happy Monday, Black Grape. There was some there's some amazing ones there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a real fucking. Um, it's it, it's just like a staple uh, yeah. venue in it, and and yeah, it was it was such a fucking great night Saturday, and it was a pleasure to have you boys on with us. No, mate, we we loved it. We'll um, I'm sure we'll do it again. Absolutely, mate. So um, you know, I touched on it just now about you boys grinding away in rehearsal rooms and doing toilet gigs for years. I think that's important to point out because um, I think, you know, you, you guys have really emerged in the last two or three years um, and you're very much what I would consider to be like a new buzz band on the circuit. Um, you know, one of the most exciting up and coming uh, guitar bands in the country, no doubt. 
Um, I agree. But, <laughs> but you haven't just appeared out of nowhere. <laughs> it's been years and years and years of grinding, isn't it? Um, yeah, man. I mean, when did you guys first get together? It was, it's was it got to be over 10 years ago, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it must be. I mean, like, ten, yeah, probably, yeah, over 10 years. And, you, you know, when you start, I reckon every band does it as well. You get three songs, you think, oh, we're tasty here. Like, give it, <laughs> give it six months, we'll be fucking, we'll be there. Yeah. And it don't work like that, does it? Like, <laughs> no, no, there's this honeymoon so period yeah, in there yeah, for yeah. a few months where you literally feel like Liam Gallagher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, you soon realise it's yeah, <laughs> a long way to the top yeah. if you want to rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of the fun of it, though, isn't it? Like, mm. like don't be wrong, it would have been nice if you fucking six months in, you're absolutely cracking it, but... Part like I mean, there's we've played to crowds with less people than this fucking room that we're recording in. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. sound checking, going back out and playing to the sound man who's yeah, just sound yeah. checker yeah, is bleak, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. But it's it's like it's like your apprenticeship, isn't it? I know it's fucking no, cool. it like, is. It's, yeah, yeah, but that, yeah. That is what it is. Yeah, it's like <laughs> like if uh, if you use boxing as an analogy, it's like your amateur career. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and you boys, um, yeah, I mean, fucking hell, you, you definitely earned your stripes, didn't you? Um, yeah, man. We, played we so we, many of them shows. Yeah, fucking too many, really. Like, we, you, you it can know. burn you out. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And and like before, you know what you're doing. When you think like, oh, we need to play in a room where there's some fucker from Island Records standing there. And 150 times they ain't standing there. Yeah, it's yeah. a bit like, oh, what the fuck? What's going on now? But we. We like we did years of like loads of rehearsing as well. Like we were, like we were we grafted at it in that sense. Like, I mean, when you started, you were so raw. I mean, Dan literally bought a drum kit, didn't he, for the purpose of starting a band? Yeah, yeah. We we were, we'd spent like ten years before it lying to birds at festivals, telling them we were a rock and roll band, <laughs> and we kept getting called on it. So we just thought, fucking, let's have a go. Like, yeah. And we were in the airport coming back from a festival in Spain. And we bought Dan a drum kit for like 50 quid, Luke a bass for like 50 quid. And then we just literally started from that. Mm. And we played 50 shows with a 50 pound drum kit. Think how yeah. shit that must have sounded. <laughs> but it, that was part of it as well. Like, and you, you wouldn't change that either because even then, like, you think, oh, we're fucking good here, man. Like, we, you know, we're not, we're not a pub band. Like, mm. But we fucking work for a long while. <laughs> well, mate, I mean, things have really... It's paid off, do you know what I mean? Oh, All that yeah, grinding, yeah. because the last three years, um, you know, things have really started to come to fruition, haven't they, for you? And I guess the big change um, was, you know, this, you making a conscious decision to to level up on the business and marketing side um, and... and uh, you know that route was investing in Facebook and Instagram ads, wasn't it? That was yeah, that man. was a turning point, really. The same for for us um, with Death of Guitar Pop. Um, you know, as I've mentioned many times on this podcast, my previous band we did all the traditional stuff and managed to get a record deal um, and an agent and and all the rest of it, and we were shelved and um, and, and nothing ever worked. And then when we tried to do it independently. We had uh, we we employed a radio plugger and a national press person and all that, and they come through with the goods here and there. We got spot plays on Radio One and Radio X, but those services cost a lot of money, and I could just see that there wasn't this fan conversion. Yeah. Um, you know, we're getting played um, at seven p.m. on a Tuesday night on Radio One is fucking awesome, and it <laughs> yeah. looks great on your socials, but it doesn't convert like. You, you you can't see it converting in real time like like these ads do. Do you know what I mean? And um, so so yeah, like when it, when I started Death of Guitar Pop, um, I'd been running ads for a business that I was doing for my day job at the time. I was a mobile car valet, and the ads were working, and I could see that this this work this could work for for music as well. I'd seen. Um, it worked really well for that band, The Hunter. And I thought, you know, we could have a crack at this yeah. with Death of Guitar Pop. It paid off. You boys made that same decision about three years ago now. And it's uh, it's been a difference, isn't it, the online marketing? Yeah, I mean, we were we were half lucky because, like, obviously, you know, we were pals with you long before Death of Guitar Pop, Bracknell, like, all that sort of stuff. Like, so we kind of saw you do it. Because, I mean, I remember, I remember going out, meeting you... 
in Covent Garden when you signed your record deal. Fucking hell, yeah. And all going out on the piss and being yeah. like, fucking hell. Do you know what, though? I don't know if it come across that night, but I felt melancholy. Really? I knew it. I just had a gut feeling. No, you you got to good. the pub after we had about eight pints of Guinness, so I wasn't like, <laughs> I, I weren't picking up on that. But I think you were more excited than I was. <laughs> well, it was because it was like, you, you used to think, like, you used to think that that was climbing the mountain, like, fucking yeah. hell, you've got there. And then obviously, it happened, what happened with you? And that was that was the that was the lesson as well. Before we even knew about this shit, it was kind of like, actually, that ain't that ain't the top really. Mm. Like that's just that's just another step on to fucking like it's a lottery ticket. Yeah, basically. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, and then, it and then ain't we this watched Holy Grail, like we all think it's gonna be. And then I remember you you putting out Ricky Old Train. It was Ricky Old Train the first one, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember talking to you like two weeks. You saying oh, I'm do, gonna do these ads and do this. And then, like, in two weeks, it was like, yeah, it's got 130,000 views or something. I remember thinking, what? <laughs> like, that that's mad. Because you, you get to a point where, like, I knew we, we was good. Like, we always knew we were good. We had fucking songs. But no, no one was hearing them. Like, no no one heard what we were doing. And it gets to a point where it's like, oh, are we, you know, are we pissing it in the wind here? Is this pointless? And then yeah. you, you show me that. I was thinking, fucking hell, like, that can work. That can yeah. work. It's, it's, I think it's hard I found it hard anyway of like going from an all out like oh my fuck I want to be a rock star mate like, I just want to get on stage and play to f- actually realising like right remember you saying to me as well we've done hundreds of hours in the music thing and that's why we're good and we're ready to go and get out there but we need to fucking put some time into like the other side of it like how are people going to hear this how are we going to get out there mm. And I suppose that's where, that's yeah, that's where it kicks off, doesn't it? Because that's, that's how we got out there. That's how people heard it, you know. Absolutely, mate. Yeah, and it, and a, and the big thing is getting your head around the fact, right? This is going to cost a few quid. Yeah, that is that's a fucker and all because like yeah. the first because it does take like it's a couple of months really, probably more than that before you start feeling the benefits. I, the thing for me was the the first sold out show. Like mm. I could never have dreamed of that a year before that of like selling out. A show and then we sold it out and it was like okay this is working like because you're sort of doing it f- blind well, faith for a while see it then, that's you? exactly like, it. it's physical form absolutely like, there are fucking 200 people in a Dublin castle that I've never met in my yeah, life mate, that, and that's the first time I ever heard it like yeah. people singing it back at you and I was thinking god this is different this is different now and it, and yeah I mean that is the fucking that is the method like mm. no, no one's going to come to you and you know, the day, like we say, the days of like someone coming and chucking money behind you and the record label. You know, mate, if it happens, it happens. Cool, but you don't need to wait for them people now. You can, no. you can do it. Yeah, you you can sort of, um, yeah, you, you can become like a, a well, yes, yeah, it, it it serves for bands to think entrepreneurially and 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 do what you guys have done and go. Right, what's it going to take to get people to hear these tunes? Um, our mates in Def Guitar Pop, it's working for them. What are they doing? They're spending between three and six hundred pounds a month on Facebook ads, and it's working. Do you know what I mean? Can, can we find that money and give it a go ourselves and see if it works for a month or two? And if it works, can we try and keep that up and monetize that fan base? and 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 recoup some costs and reinvest in everything and yeah that's exactly the cycle that's played out for for you boys i was trying to work it out i think it was like was it like first quarter of 2019 when when you started investing in the ads can you oh, remember mate, I, I can't remember i know that we the first show was supposed to be in the bang in the middle of covid yeah and so that got pushed back and because i suppose weirdly like as fucking terrible as that time was it that that weren't bad for us in terms of like because it just forced us to focus on that because we mm. couldn't get out and re- rehearse we couldn't get out and play so we we that's the first time that we actually went into that that side of things and like right let's focus on how we get it out there using these ads these things that you'd showed us you know mm. but yeah it's, it's been a few years now and it? it must have been yeah, I'm. I'm pretty sure we started in 2019, and I think that um, I'm not sure if like the first year and a half was consistently at least 300 pound a month on ads. I think there was a bit, 
I mean, you paused here and there and reassessed, and obviously it's hard to, to maintain it, that because that's coming out of your. It was like it was the show that really income. forced us into it because, like I say, before then, all of a sudden, like we, we you know, we're getting up and working, and we we're sacking off like a few nights on the piss to put money into like Facebook. I think I don't even go on Facebook, like <laughs> yeah. And then and all of a sudden, like we're doing we're doing this, but it that's why people you got to stick with it, man. You have got to have like faith in it because it up until I would say up until that first show when people were there because that's what that's what I care about really like the the live thing like that that was what that's what I'm in it for and when I saw it affected that I was mm. like oh, all right the train's left the station man like yeah. this is the this is the way now and we've never stopped it since like no it's been uh, yeah it's been aggressive since then yeah. isn't it? I mean so yeah so so uh, let's let's go into that a little bit so I'm pretty sure the first ad, well, no, the first ad was Good to the Bone live session. Yeah, video, yeah. Wasn't it? Because you didn't have a studio recording of that song nah, then. Nah. Um, and we marketed that um, to fans of like U2, Springsteen, Tom Petty, I think it was as yeah, well. I, I can't even remember my And those ads it? worked instantly, didn't they? We were marketing to the US as well. Um I think I've learned a lot since the marketer then. Like, it worked because I remember you had, like, Springsteen fans out in America yeah. saying, like, it's Friday night, I've just cracked open a beer and myself and the wife are uh, slow dancing to this beautiful love <laughs> yeah, we song. We had a geezer then. from, like, Canada come to us. Like, it'd been out for, like, six weeks and the geezer would come out to us and said, like, I get married to my high school sweetheart on Saturday and our first dance is going to be good to the bone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just all this thinking, mad I fucking shit guarantee the DJ ain't got that, mate. You're, <laughs> you're fucked. <laughs> but then, yeah, we sort of soon learned through our trial and error with Def Guitar Pop and the other bands we're helping right. If there's a chance to build a UK touring business, as much as you might sound a bit like Springsteen and... Uh, you know, you two or whatever, and they've got massive US fan bases that you can tap into through these ads. If we want to grow a touring business, we're going to have to stick to the UK. Yeah, yeah. So I think we refined it, and and the UK, the UK worked, and that was converting well. Um, but the real turning point was, I think this was 2021. Uh, when I don't understand it come out, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's that like, was the the lift off one, really. Yeah, so we just I think we all collectively felt like fucking hell. This tune is like a level up, and yeah. the music video. Brad is sat with us this evening. Who is who, uh, filmed and edited Hello. the video. <laughs> um, the, the visuals just so fucking strong, like, and 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 it's the perfect. Um, yeah, it's the perfect visual to go with that song. And it had this like Brit pop swagger yeah. uh, to it, and um, yeah, I just think you you guys had, had developed your sound a bit, and and were definitely going more down the 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 road of like Oasis, The Verve, Kasabian. Um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like that yeah. that that sort of British, um, for want of a better phrase, like lad rock um, guitar music. You know the the. the the, the bands that, um, you know, have the football fan audiences. And so we knew we had to... Usually when a fan growth ad is working, like Good to the Bone Live was working as a fan growth ad on Facebook, we we don't like to mix it up and we want to keep going back to that well. And, and for every 10 or £5 a day that you're spending on that ad, um, you know, you, you're introducing yourself to... 30 40 new people a day and that that video ad is building more virality each day and and so that's that's really the main method to what we do on the marketing side we build a viral video ad through long-term investment and that works as like a shop window um for for diy musicians to onboard fans do you know what i mean and we target the fan bases of um, you know the the affinity artists for for whatever band. So obviously for you guys, yeah, good to the bone was was Springs Springsteen because it's a uh, in case uh, listeners don't know it's a, it's a, it's a big ballad and it's yeah, kind yeah. of Springsteen U two esque in it. So we were targeting um, yeah that fan base, but as soon as um, yeah as soon as the video come back for good uh, for. I don't understand it. It was like, right, I think we should switch it up and go for the, you know, the British indie Britpop like yeah, fans. Do you know what I mean? Um, 
and that was a that was a good move, wasn't it? Because things have gone up another level since that's been our sort of main marketing angle for the Bracknell. Yeah, I think it, it's like it, it that was always more I don't want to say authentic because like good to the bone still in the set now and it's it's authentic, but like the, this thing that we've cultivated now with our fan base and like through that ad. That is what we are. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We are just. We all go to the football. We all fucking mm. like that is our fan base. So look, like it was. That was like you say. It's trial and error to a point. But that was the first time we actually was like that was. This is actually us now. Like we're actually off, which is important as well because that people people see through that if it ain't, don't they? Do yeah, you know it's I mean? got to be authentic. Yeah, yeah it's got to be. And um, and and it make, does make you realise as well. Like people who try and say like like guitar music's dying mate as soon as you that's the other good thing about these ads it does make you realise like people are out there and they love it and they think the same thing we think about these shit piece radios mm. that play four bands and boy bands and like there's people want to hear this shit man like mm. you've got to go and find them now it's like, not dying it's it's like fuck you know uh Fans of, of that music are starving for new bands. Absolutely, you know I mean? man. Like, but, but you know what? It, you, right? it ain't going to be the story where you fucking... Someone boots the doors in of some ropey boozer in Clacton and says, like, you're going to be a snack, kid. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you you got to go and find them now. And But fuck it, I'm, I like that. I like that's that. great. Like, yeah. you're the one kicking the door down. Like, Yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're in the driving seat, do you know what I mean, of, of of your career. You're not waiting for some label to put your single out or, like, clear the, the sign the budget off on a music video. You can get out there and do it yourselves on Absolutely, the cheap DIY yeah. and, and get it straight out to your audience. Um, so well, the I Don't Understand video took, how long did it take? 25 minutes. We walked up the road twice. We only had two flares, so we could only do it twice. <laughs> it, it was like, it was in, in the lockdown when, like, you weren't really supposed to be about, like, we had to do it outside in the open. It was like, yeah. right, let's go over the road, walk up the hill to us, and there it was. Like, yeah, fucking great visual, man. So targeting, targeting like Oasis, Kasabian, uh, The Verve, etc. Um, targeting th- those those bands with that music video on Facebook was a real turning point. Um, and and a few months on from that, uh, we then. We then uh, started marketing to the same crowd on Instagram and noticed that like a bit of a young audience was coming through as well. Um, I guess they're more like, you know, Instagram centric, um, the younger indie fans. Um, but yeah, that, that was a real turning point, that song. Yeah, man, it was, it was, it's important. I think that'll always be important, really, because of that. Like, that was the one that kicked it off, you know. Greetings, listeners. Jake from Decent Mastering here. Really pleased to be involved with a podcast whose ethos aligns with my own, helping independent artists. My Pay What You Feel mastering service offers inclusivity to music creators with tighter budgets, giving quality audio at a price that suits them. To get in contact, send an email to decentmastering at gmail.com or send me a DM on Instagram at decentmastering. Enjoy the rest of the show. So yeah, we um, we pretty much struck gold with that Facebook ad um, for I don't understand it, and that's been um, doing the business ever since, really. And every time we switch it back on, um, new fans come into the funnel. Um, so yeah, but prior to that, I think it's worth mentioning you'd sold the Dublin Castle out. Yeah. Um, the good to the bone ad had, had got you to that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there was there was also there was a um, an EP release, wasn't there? That we we offered as like a free plus shipping yeah, offer. Yeah. So um, it's where the um, <clears throat> the fan just plays the postage and packaging costs, but the RRP of the CD uh, is free. And um, I think you sold like a good three four hundred of them, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so, so I think you know building that monetized list of supporters helped us then sell out the Dublin Castle, um, and then yeah, we we you you guys um, recorded this new song. I don't understand it. Uh, Brad created this amazing visual for it. Uh, well, yourselves and Brad, because obviously you had a hand in the concept of the video. And um, and then the target audience um, like 
pulls in the good to the bone ad and like throwing the dice on a new audience on Facebook really paid off because yeah, yeah. like overnight the results were like fuck there was like I remember like from 24 hours from the ad being switched on there was like 10 comments yeah. there from people like just loving it um, so that's that's been doing the business ever since that ad um, and as I mentioned we've now got a version of it well I say a version of it on Instagram the Instagram ad is a is a show reel of like three or four of your music videos in it but it leads with I don't I understand, understand it, it. Yeah. the same people that we target with the Facebook ad so fans of Oasis the Verve Kasabian and the alike I think um, we did one for X, Radio X as well, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, and annoyingly, Radio X don't come up anymore on the target. Oh, really? Absolute Radio's in there, actually. That's right. worth mentioning. So the the fan growth ads like on Instagram and Facebook, particularly since the, I think it was the, the first quarter of 2021 when um, I Don't Understand It come out, have, have been like, you know, a... a a real sort of breakthrough for this band and finding your your tribe online um the free plus shipping ep w- was great um you know what followed on from uh, the good to the bone ad the dublin castle the, the free plus shipping ep the dublin castle and then the launch of this great campaign with um i don't understand it it still runs today was then um, the sellout Underworld show that happened at the end of last year. Now, yeah, you did man. a good it's like a year's run-up, wasn't it, like yeah, marketing yeah. that show. Um, so that was a huge, huge moment for you, wasn't it, selling out the Underworld, and, and you sold it out three months in advance. Yeah, we sold it out like double early, which is, which is Matt. Again, it's just more gratification to point. It's like, God, this is, this is working now, this is happening. Yeah. And obviously we had the album before that, so like... Yeah, so sorry, yeah, I've missed something out there on in the uh, timeline. So so you crowdfunded your debut album yeah. and raised £10,000, wasn't it? Something like that, yeah, it was mad. Yeah, yeah, so, so that, like I've said on this podcast before, crowdfunding is so good for DIY bands because you're essentially creating the equivalent of a record company advance... Uh, for yourself that you don't have to pay back that's your your money from your fan base you just got to make sure you obviously fulfill the album um so yeah the the crowdfunding must have i guess that was the next thing after dublin castle and you mentioned that the dublin castle was a big moment where you felt that sort of validation and thought yeah we've really got to push on with this strategy because it's working i'm now seeing it in the flesh there's there's 200 like music fans that have packed into the Dublin Castle to come and see us. The crowdfunding goal, I think you hit that shortly after the Dublin Castle gig and raised £10,000 to release your debut. That must have been very reassuring as well, right? Yeah, man, because it's like you feel like, oh, these are my people. These are like, they're with us, like, you know, and that, and again, like, if you're honest, when when you first heard about crowdfunding, I was just all green to it, do you know what I mean? So we we didn't know anything about this. Like, you first heard about it and I was like, Oh, how comfortable am I doing that? But like, people want to help you, man. Like, mm. and also, also, this shit, it ain't cheap. Like, it, like to do stuff, you need, we need that help. And so, like, when when people throw their their weight and their money behind you, and they're like, right, go and do it. We want to hear it. It just again, it like, you need these things to keep you going. It keeps you motivated. It keeps you at it, knowing that there is, there's a lot, there's a group of people here who want this now. Like, yeah is is massive like it just it keep, keeps the momentum it keep even in the band like it keeps you f- right we the next thing we've got to keep right and we've got to get, stay on your toes like it's it's, it's well important that because mm. I, don't, I don't know realistically how, how else we'd have done it you know yeah yeah well definitely i mean for us it's been huge do you know what i mean we've four albums in now and every single album has been crowdfunded um it's been huge for us really like our fucking lifeblood as, as a diy band um so so i think it's important as well to um to to sort of point this out um you know for the benefit of of um our listener base that might not have have, have spent out on marketing yet and and are considering doing it um but are unsure and a bit worried about taking that risk you boys have been spending between three and six hundred pound on ads consistently for a good couple of years now at least haven't you 
Um, yeah. I don't think it was uh, that like in the first year. Um, it, it, it was you know some months for three hundred, then you'd pause for a few weeks and then go again or whatever. But I know that since I don't understand it, it's been consistent and it you've not taken your foot off the gas and you've you've kept by hook or by crook, whether it's money that the the band have made that you've reinvested or you know money from your your own pockets from your from your day job wages or whatever you've um, made a long-term commitment to keep promoting yourselves and paying to promote yourselves so that you can build this DIY music business. Yeah, man, and it ain't like, it ain't easy finding that dough. Like, like it's there's some months where it's like, fucking hell, like, uh, can we do this? But like I said, like, once you get that first, like, bit come back in, like, the gratification, you realise, like, like, this, this is it. This is what we want. This is the, this is plan A sort of thing, like, you fucking figure it out, you know. Like I know, I know it ain't easy, and, and it weren't easy for us, but we just you figure it out, man. Because every time that you sell a gig out, or you, or you, you know, your album, like we sold so many albums in the end, it's like it's massive, like you, and it ain't coming without that shit, you know. You got to put in to get out, really. Absolutely, yeah, it's like any other business, yeah, man. man. Um, and and so yeah, the tour went on sale. Um, what was it like last quarter of last year the tour went on yeah, sale yeah and it, it sold out fucking quickly yeah man it? we sold out all like seven dates within like i, I want to say two two and a half months yeah two yeah months. It was crazy like we barely like usually so in my experience with like the death of guitar pop tour we spent quite a lot of money retargeting our fan base to hit the kind of numbers that you boys um uh, uh, have hit and you didn't need to do that, do you know what I mean? Within like a couple of months of organically posting about it and a few retargeting campaigns and some emails and texts and that, it was all all sold out like yeah, man. very quickly. And you know, so so what we're talking like um, it's, it's Birmingham and it Glasgow, Birmingham, Leeds, Glasgow, Manchester. Obviously, the London leg was was supporting you guys, yeah, and Dublin. And what's the average venue cap? Like 200, isn't it? 250 is yeah. the average, yeah. So you sold like the night and day out in Manchester, didn't yeah. you? Like, with, that was like a week, wasn't it? That... Yeah, it's 10 days, something mental <laughs> yeah. like that. 10 yeah. days, like... And I can't wait for that out. one. I can't wait for that one. Yeah, it's going to be great, man. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just incredible. I don't think... I'm not sure... Uh, you know, there's not many other bands out there on the circuit that haven't got some kind of backing, like an agent or... Um, you know, management company or a, a big promoter in their corner that are, that that are able to do that. Do you know what I mean? What you've achieved with those ticket sales—that's massive. Um, and what you've what you've got uh, what what you've since announced is a headline show at the Earth Theatre in Hackney, which is a seven hundred cap, isn't it? Yeah, man. And you mentioned earlier that that one on sale was it last week or the week before? Week today, yeah. Week week today they went on sale. Twenty five percent sold out already, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, mad. And you've not. Uh, is there an ad running for that? No. So yeah, there's no paid traffic on that. That's literally just organic announcing the show. I moaned at you earlier because you haven't even done a Mailchimp yet <laughs> <laughs> to to let your fucking email subscribers know. Big got time, Charlie's and we. That'd be another <laughs> fucking hundred sales. So it's incredible. Like organically, you are now you know, reaping the benefits of this long-term investment of, you know, grinding in the rehearsal room and doing all these toilet gigs, then the last two or three years of investing money out of your own pockets into marketing, now you're seeing it because... Yeah, and, and if, like, the, the, the thing is, like, you, you, can, you can have the best marketing in the world, but if you are if you ain't any good, then you, you know what I mean, you ain't got much chance. So, like, we, we, we knew we was good... And then we it's like getting people around you that know what they're talking about is obviously well important. Like, you know, we got a well good team around us almost. Like, we got you helping us with the like the marketing side of things. And like for a long while, like you were kind of like head of the ship, like directing us. Like we were kind of following your path. Now we got Els who does the management stuff, who shit up well on it. Yeah, big up El, which like, is awesome. We got obviously had Brad around doing all like the the visuals and stuff. Um, you know, we had. Jill, who, our mate Jill, who's like a wicked photographer as well, do all the album artwork. So like, we've always put ourselves around people that know what they're doing. But you know, we are also fucking sick. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah, I can vouch for that. If you've not heard the Bracknell yet, <laughs> go and stream them. Right. Do you know what? Switch the fucking podcast on, <laughs> off, and just go and have a listen. They're fucking unbelievable. Yeah. So, so yeah, you, you're reaping the benefits now, and I think, you know, uh, something else that I think is important to point out is you're your own promoter. You're you're hiring these venues yourself, aren't yeah, you? Man. You're uh, and you're setting. You've set up your own ticket in. So when these ticket sales come in, obviously the venues get um, a small allocation because they've all got deals with C tickets, Dias, whoever. Yeah, yeah. But the lion's share of the tickets is your allocation as the promoter, and you're selling those tickets through your own Shopify store. Yeah. So you're you're seeing that money in real time. It's hitting your PayPal and your Stripe or whatever in real time. So when you sell two hundred tickets for the Earth theater um you know which is a gig that's like what six seven months away um uh, yeah in, in week one of launching them that money's hitting your bank account straight away um, which is massive as well because like there's it's, even if it's like the ads everything you the m- money coming in just lets you do it, like lets you do what you got to do next like yeah which is so important i don't know how we'd have kept scaling it and kept like momentum if we didn't have that like a stead like with the tickets and even the merch and things like giving giving ourselves uh, you know a few quid to play with like is important that it's so important yeah. mate yeah yeah and so many bands go down the route of you know agent promoter then you know you're giving away a massive cut and i'm not saying this you know obviously it's good to have an agent and a promoter there's there's loads of of pluses to that do you know what i mean the opportunities that that can open up for a new band like yourselves with supports and festivals and everything else um but yeah if you can pull the numbers on your own tour um what happen what happens if if you're booked by an agent and a promoter you've got to wait for your ticket money and your cut till usually after the tour's over. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So bank rolling like the van, the hotels, the fucking um, you know all the merch that you got to buy up front to sell on tour and everything else. That's hard to do, man. Yeah, man. When when you when you're um, even if you've got label funding and everything else, like it's it's, it's a very hard thing for for an artist to um, to finance. So the fact that you're able to to see that money in real time and bankroll it yourselves is, is fantastic, mate. Do you know what I mean? It puts you in a really strong position um, as as a DIY artist business. It's you're self sufficient essentially, um, and I wish more bands knew that that was possible. That mate, the biggest thing with this right is I don't know I don't know enough about the ins and outs of the fucking record industry and stuff. I'm not bothered by it, but. I don't know what will be good for us in down the road, for here, there, and everywhere. But the best thing about this is it makes you realise like you don't need that. You yeah. don't need that. You can do this without that. Like you know, you ain't got to be that forever. But you right now, you don't need some geezer telling you what to do. Just go and do it. You know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's and it's a grind and it's costly. Do you know what I mean? Um, and you have to make sacrifices, do you know what I mean? Unless yeah, you've got some fun. fucking big trust fund or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as you say, it's totally achievable DIY now, more than ever. Um, so yeah, but it, but it's important to, to clue yourself up on the business and marketing side. Um, it, yeah, it's, it's just for me, like I said, I've been on the other side of it where I was completely reliant on gatekeepers in the music industry labels agents etc um you know uh, and was hoping that having that set up would get me in a position where i'm doing like what you guys are doing now uh and that that never happened for me going down that traditional route whereas you know teaching myself the business and marketing and investing in myself uh, like you at first it was my day job wages do you know what i mean on the mine and johnny's wages uh, at the end of every month, we'd we'd invest a chunk of those into um, into the Facebook ads for Death of Guitar Pop, and yeah, having like you know, having uh, having tried both journeys, this is so much better, so much more fulfilling, um, and yeah, it's just awesome that artists like yourself have followed suit and are on that same trajectory. 
Um, you're going to sell worth Hackney out, man. 700 tickets. Oh, I think so, which is... You are going to, mate. And I, and I believe that next year you'll be headlining Electric Ballroom yourselves um, by the end of the year, no doubt, or, or if not bigger. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's just, it's just awesome that there's other DIY musicians out there that are inspired by what we're doing somewhat and oh, um definitely. you know taking the same entrepreneurial approach as us um it's, it's really flattering mate and it's yeah it's just a fucking joy to work uh with you boys and yeah uh h- help you market and monetize without the need for any gatekeeper it's um it's oh, a beautiful thing mate. yeah couldn't agree more cool all right mate um should we wrap up there let's do it jack mate it's been an absolute pleasure uh we'll have you all mine. <laughs> all mine cheers buddy we'll have you on yeah probably later on in the year after the uh, earth gig it'd be great to talk about that and what went into marketing that because it's going to sell out so that'd be um yeah an interesting place to pick up once earth sold out at the end of the year absolutely mate look forward to it nice one geezer tell them mate oi oi people silky here i hope you enjoyed my chat with jack dacey from the bracknell to listen to more conversations with like-minded creatives that have dedicated their lives to a career in music You can check out more episodes of the Life of Musician podcast on all major streaming platforms now.